Hello, geologist, and welcome to Section 9, The Rock Cycle. Before you think this is just a review of everything you've learned, it's not just that. It's so much more. Please watch this video. You have learned about geologic principles and dynamo earth and plate tectonics and minerals. Then we started in with igneous rocks and went on into sedimentary rocks and depositional environments. Then we moved into metamorphic rocks. And here we are wrapping it up together for the rocks so they make sense in the rock cycle. So I'm at a place in Washington State. If you watch any of the Twilight movies, this is right near where Forks, Washington State is, and it's a beautiful place. That is an in interesting location because it's a temperate rainforest, so this side is actually on the wet side of the rainforest, and then you get a big mountain range, and on the other side of Olympic National Park is a rain shadow desert. And we'll be learning more about rain shadow deserts in the very last section of the semester. But when you look at this picture, this image, I see a fluvial system, that's your river system, feeding into a tidal flat section, so it's transitional. Then I see the marine environment out in the open. I see biological weathering. There could be some chemical weathering there. Certainly physical weathering, evidence of flooding as you see all the driftwood that's everywhere. The point is, is that by now, you should be piecing together clues. And those clues are everywhere in nature. And the rock cycle, its intention is to show you how rocks are interrelated, but yet how they're different. So let's get right to it. So what exactly is the rock cycle? By the way, the father of the rock cycle is James Hutton. He's also the father of modern geology. He conceptualized that rocks were similar, yet they'd likely gone through various different cycles of life. And what we mean by that, while they're inorganic solids and are not truly living, they've just gone through different stages of formation. Everything with the rock cycle started somewhere, though. Every part in every rock in the rock cycle started in the same place. It all started with magma which is molten rock. And I want to be very clear how that differentiates from lava. Magma came first. Our Earth was molten, the whole thing, from the inside all the way to the top surface for a period of time early in geologic history. Before the Earth started cooling down the internal section of it enough to create a crust, so that meant that we had magma at the surface, and once that magma had crystallized into lava, then we had the part two of molten rock lava. From there, lava could be weathered, eroded, it could be metamorphosed inside the earth as it got subducted or buried under sediments. So in a rock cycle situation, a rock may not go through all stages of the rock cycle from, from its birth. So it may just be an igneous rock for a very, very long time or a metamorphic rock, and I could mean up to like 4.2 billion years, which is the oldest terrestrial rock that's at current considered to be in existence that is terrestrial, meaning it didn't fall from outer space as a meteorite. So how could a rock stay in the same form for so long? So a number of reasons. The first might be its location. So if you're inside the middle of what's called a craton or a shield, which is the center stable parts of continents that don't get bombarded by plate collisions, it may not change that much. So that's one way. Another way is that it is just lucky. And not very many rocks are that lucky, to be honest, because most of them are going to get recycled in the rock cycle in some shape, fashion, or form multiple times. One really cool thing about the recycling process of rocks is that some of the original min minerals on Earth, which were zircons, they formed right as the magmatic processes started to crystallize and the Earth's temperature dropped enough to crystallize this mineral, Zircons have been around the longest, so 
what's cool about them is they've been in rocks because they've gone through so many cycles of the rock uh, process from igneous to metamorphic to sedimentary, maybe back to another sedimentary rock, maybe to another igneous rock, maybe to back to sedimentary, maybe it got metamorphosed five times. My point is you don't necessarily have your zircon and the other minerals and rocks go through one phase cleanly to another phase, like from igneous to sedimentary, sedimentary to metamorphic, and back to igneous. It doesn't work that way. It can go from any stage at any time or stay in one stage and duplicate like being a sedimentary rock four or five times. But the thing about zircons that makes it special is that zircons require such hot temperatures to be made that we don't have hot enough temperatures anymore to melt them. So with every alteration that they've undergone for billions of years of the Earth's existence, they have layers of crystalline structure that represent those changes. So you might have a zircon that shows some kind of mountain building event three billion years ago or two billion years ago, and then again a billion years ago, and then 550 million years ago, and then again uh, during let's say 66 million years ago and 50 million years ago. So you have all of these histories encompassed in just looking under its crystal and structure and microscopic view, you can see and piece together the Earth's history. So zircons are kind of a big deal when we're talking about the rock cycle because they prove that rocks do go through these unique cycles. So the rock cycle simply is the formation, alteration, destruction, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, destruction, and remaking, rebirthing of rocks from natural processes on Earth. That could be from weathering, erosion, burial, subduction, metamorphism, melting, cementation, lithification, all these terms you've been learning about. So let me go back to that destruction of rocks. We never truly destroy the rock material. We just may destroy the rock that was made. So we're not shipping rock material out in the space right now. So that means that we're recycling what we've already got here. Doesn't mean we might not do that in the future, but I want to point that out right now that the destruction is not of the material. The destruction is of the rock itself and it's being remade into something new. In a nutshell, that's the rock cycle. So if it wasn't clear to begin with, let me re-emphasize how important the cornerstone, the beginning of the rock cycle is, and that is magma, molten rock. So here's an active magma chamber. You've seen this diagram already once, and an inactive. So this is where it's crystallized and cooled down, and now it's just a, a plutonic intrusive igneous rock. In order to have a lava eruption, you would have to have the magma first. My point is the rock cycle never could have gotten a kickstart without the help of magma. So that is the origin point, the beginning of how all this started. And there was an actual beginning point. It wasn't like it just started when the earth was made. It started when we finally had radioactive heat from the decay of radioactive elements in the core that started to create convection and started to make magma plumes, which were hot spots that worked its way through the asthenosphere and started to bring molten rock up to the surface. So all of these things had to fall into place to initiate rock cycle status on Earth. But we are going to do a review of rocks because I want to make sure that when it comes time for your exams on rocks that you are clear that these rocks have these terms, these have another, these have the others, how they're related and how they're not. So igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks all have special terms to describe their textures. And so those cannot be transposed to another rock type. For example, igneous rocks you can see this is phaneritic texture, this is aphanitic texture. Phaneritic, phaneritic texture has the interlocking crystals. Aphanitic texture does not, although it could have phenocryst, which is the porphyritic texture like this andesite does right here. So igneous rocks are always made by molten rock material. The 
trick is and the important key is where did it crystallize and cool off? Where did those minerals grow? And the length of time they have to grow is going to dictate if they're going to be phaneritic or aphanitic. So when you have plutonic rocks that are cooling beneath the surface, miles beneath the surface, sometimes tens and 20 miles and 30 and 40 and 50-ish miles below the surface, sometimes just a couple of miles below the surface. That's going to change the character. Also, I might add the chemistry that we learned about margarita mixes of all of these various different igneous rocks. So let's get on with it and get back to those margarita mixes. So if you remember felsic rocks, they were the real cool ones in terms of temperature. So they crystallized at very lower temperatures. They had lots of quartz, potassium feldspar, which is pink. They had some of the black stuff that makes the little spots in them as biotite, but they do not have the same minerals like you would see in mafic and ultramafic. Since they're cooler, they crystallize, and when you have a volcanic eruption of felsic material, it is super violent, you have pyroclastic flows, you have lahars, you likely have lava domes that collapse. These are very special rocks when you have volcanoes that produce rhyolite. Which brings me to how we read this chart, because remember that every one of these groups, felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic, have an intrusive slash plutonic rock that's for that Pacific uh, type of chemistry and it has a matching corresponding uh, mate, for better lack of words, that's extrusive slash volcanic. And in the case of Felsic, the intrusive plutonic rock is granite and the extrusive uh, volcanic rock is rhyolite. So if the colors for felsic are the pinks, the tans, the whites, and very, very light shades of gray. The intermediates are the 50 shades of gray. That's the big joke on intermediates. And then you get the mafics, which are super, super dark shades of gray and black. And then you get the ultra mafic, which have uh, black and green in them. So, of course, we're going to have rocks that are made on these boundary markers, like between mavic and ultramavic, and between intermediate and mavic, and between felsic and intermediate. My point is this. You're not going to have the perfect trained eye to know which is which, but you're going to work on that. You'll get better with practice. But you do need to understand the premise that as we have higher silica, there are lower temperatures, in the magmatic material, whether it's magma or lava, which is going to dictate, if we do have a lava eruption, its explosivity. So if I was in the intermediate category, if I'm closer to the 65%, which is near right at the boundary marker of Felsic, that's going to be like a Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption. If I'm down here and I'm next to the 53%, which is the boundary marker to our mafic, if I'm at the boundary marker on the back side here of intermediate, I am going to, to mafic. I'm going to be having a more fluidy eruption. I'm going to be darker. I'm not going to be as viscous. You'll learn about viscosity later in the semester. It means thickness. So the change in character if you have a volcanic eruption is radically different from just that few, almost, you know, a little over 10% difference there. It changes everything. So if you could imagine back in the Precambrian days when we had a much hotter interior of the earth and we had ultramafic lava flows, they would have been much more like flowing like a river fast and super hot, and they would not have produced these violent eruptions that we have today um, in some areas like subduction zones where you have high silica eruptions. Of course, sedimentary rocks are just about everywhere we look. They cover 75% of the surface of the earth, and they're just so prevalent because they're breaking down via weathering any kind of rock at the surface. So you have to remember, igneous rocks, even plutonic ones, can get shoved up to the surface in mountain building, or rock layers can be weathered and eroded off, and they're exposed at the surface. Case in point would be Yosemite National Park, where all of these igneous rocks that are part of the giant Sierra Nevada batholith system are exposed there in California. 
So there are two groups of sedimentary rocks, clastic slash detrital. They mean the same thing. They're hodgepodge of rock sizes that are uh, stuck together by cementation and hardened, and that term for hardening is lithification. So that is a, a key group of rocks in the sedimentary category. The second major group are the chemical slash biochemical rocks. And these are usually made by a process of dead organisms that may accumulate and make layers of rock material, or it could be from a precipitate, from a chemical reaction, or it could even be from evaporites, which is where water evaporates and leaves behind a solid deposit. In this image right here of going to the Sun Road, this is the river that's right next to it in uh, Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. You think I am kidding about how awesome going to the Sun Road is? Just Google it and see how awesome this place looks, because it is. This river follows that road, just kind of the road is right next to it. And you can even buy apparel from Glacier National Park that is going to the Sun apparel, because it's so incredible of a road. Nevertheless, this is just a tremendous river. Not only is it beautiful, but you can see weathering happening before your eyes. So at the bottom of that river basin, you can imagine the stones and the rocks that are falling off here and here in the canyon walls are grinding at the bottom. So that's going to allow for breaking down of more rock and also scouring the bedrock, which that stuff gets carried downstream and redeposited as a new sedimentary rock. The point being is... It's happening before your eyes everywhere. Sedimentary rocks are being made, they're being altered, they're being destroyed and made into something new. Weathering and erosion were two big concepts of these first nine sections that you've had. So weathering is the breaking down of stuff and erosion is the transportation. So I'd ask you to look at these three pictures and identify the one where erosion is present. That's going to be not just the breaking down, but the removal of those broken down sediments. Is it where the bent trees coming out in Glacier National Park on the left causing biological and mechanical weathering? So it's breaking up rocks and rocks are falling to the road down there or middle where you see the Grand Canyon or is it on the right side where you see a big section of a rock slide that fell off and all the rocks are at the bottom of the canyon. They're giant boulders bigger than sometimes a house in size. Which one represents the erosion? Remember that's the removal. So I'm going to give you a hint. I'm sure you've guessed it already. It's this one, the Grand Canyon. This is the gorge down here where the Vishnu Schist, yeah, that's a mouthful, right? Vishnu, V-I-S-H-N-U, Schist. It's a metamorphic rock. And then there's the Zoroaster Granite. That makes up the two major rock formations down here. They are so rock solid. They represented the cores of ancient mountain ranges. And all these sedimentary rocks that are on top, are much, 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 much younger. You're going to learn about that when we move on to some of the new sections, like section 11. It's called the Great Unconformity. Nevertheless, the river that carved all this stuff down did it in record time geologically. Did it in less than 6 million years. So that is like super Olympic fast when it comes to erosion. That stuff's not just been weathered down, it's been eroded, it's been removed and carried downstream. So it means the lakes that are receiving the water that contains the sediment are being overloaded with sediment. That's problematic for places like Lake Mead. Lake Mead is like one of the primary sole drinking water resources for Las Vegas. And so what happens when the lake fills up with sediments? What do we do about that? That's a whole nother story, but it is something that you should be concerned about if your drinking water comes from a lake. All right, let's talk about metamorphic rocks. What makes these special as compared to the other two? They have a very, very narrow window of opportunity to form from right at the surface down to about 55 kilometers. And if we're lucky, they get brought up to the surface and some kind of uplift or weathering and erosion down to where they're located. 
one important differentiating fact between these rocks and sedimentary and igneous. They never melt. Neither do sedimentary rocks for that matter, but metamorphic rocks while they're inside the earth are not 100% molten. If they were, they would be in the igneous rock category. We have some that flirt with that boundary marker of being almost molten, so you'll have a lot of minerals that could uh, melt, they get hot enough to do that, but the other minerals in them do not. This is why we have such spectacular metamorphic rocks that are beautiful, rare, and have some cool gemstones in them. But metamorphic rocks can have one or two texture types, so it can either be foliated or non-foliated. So for sedimentary, the texture types were clastic slash tridal or chemical slash biochemical, and for igneous, it was phanaritic or aphanitic. So when we're talking about foliated and non-foliated texture for metamorphic rocks, you cannot apply the other two rock types texture terms to this one and vice versa. Foliated texture means the, a lot of pressure, and I would also say usually heat has helped in aligning the crystals in a more parallel fashion. Not the case for non-foliated, so you have more of a heat situation going on. And when we look at the different types of foliated and non-foliated rocks that you learned about in Section 8, then you can see how the progression of grade of metamorphism matters. So the lower the grade, the less intensity of heat and or pressure or, and, I might add, chemically active fluids have affected that rock. And the higher you get, the more extreme those changes have been. Which brings me to this. This is a great example of looking at the common foliated metamorphic rocks. Uh, you started with a sedimentary rock of shale and it underwent some heat and pressure and turned into slate. Sl By the way, slate is what makes up your uh, really expensive pool tables and dry erase boards. That's the, the sub uh, material behind that. Phyolite has a little higher temperature, so it makes some of these things like musk uh, muscovite and biotite. Chlorite gives it more of a metallic sheen, and it has more pressure applied to it, so it kind of has a wavy appearance on top. Schist is, if you follow, here's the low end of schist and the higher end of schist, and you follow through, you can make all these minerals that I'm pointing to right here. But notice one of the main ones is garnets. So garnets are commonly found in schist. Then you get to gneiss, and gneiss is the banded metamorphic foliated rock. They would just say nice is the highest grade. That is a common metamorphic rock. Then you get it into molten category. So there are a few times that I've seen nice that has some granite right next to it. And it's because there just wasn't enough heat and pressure to change it or there was some kind of unique situation there. Again, those metamorphic rocks can only form to a certain depth. Remember geothermal gradient? That is a good test question. You need to know what that degree change is per kilometer that we go down. It's 25 degrees. And each of these markers, like green schist species and blue schist species, uh, granulite species, all of these represent very specific conditions that are common that make these very unique rocks groups. I discussed how blue schist facies was formed in metamorphic section and it's such a rare circumstance to have a set of rocks subducted a slab really quickly and then it doesn't stay very that deep for very long so it doesn't cook for much and it gets pulled back up because of a, some kind of a plate collision. So it never gets that hot but it gets pretty deep and has a lot of pressure and that allows for these really remarkable rocks to be made that are associated with the blue schist facies. So I thought I'd do some can you recognize what group I belong to rocks because you've seen all of this but now we really need to apply it so if you're walking around and you look on the ground and you see something you could say hey that's a sedimentary igneous metamorphic rock and maybe even be able to tell their texture you may be able to tell them by their name even. So a couple of hints here. We've got rocks of other broken down stuff stuck together, cemented and lithified. Those are cues for sedimentary rocks. Yep, sedimentary. So my question is, which is the conglomerate, which is the breccia, and how do you tell the difference? So remember that conglomerates must have at least 
50% roundish clasped, while your angular brachia must have at least 50% angular clasped. And I think you can tell the difference here. But the storyboard would be which one got buried fast, which one was traveled for a long distance likely in a river basin. So if you answered buried fast, you would have been brachia, which is right here. And then the conglomeratic rock was uh, rounded. The class were rounded by fluvial weathering and erosion. So what type of rocks do these represent? If they're a pair, that might help. I don't always show them in pairs, uh, like on test and stuff. But the idea is that you can see they are match. They are the same chemistry. So that puts it in the margarita group and that would be igneous, right? So remember that the pink ones, pinks, whites, tans, and super, super light shades of gray, they represent felsic chemistry. So you've got an extrusive at the top or volcanic rock at the top and you've got its matching counterpart down here that would be plutonic slash intrusive. So you need to know which rock is which because it's always going to be that rock for felsic. So the plutonic rock is always granite and the volcanic rock is always rhyolite. While there are many types of both, they're still just rhyolite and granite. When you look at these two rocks, are they igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic? How do you tell? And you're like, oh, I see some layering. That would be a, a, a clue, a good one. So let's start there. If you see layering, maybe there could be some banding that would say that it's in metamorphic and it's nice, but I don't see that. This banding right here, it's not really banding. It's iron oxide deposits in that rock. Instead, these are clastic detrital rocks. The difference between them is the average class size is much smaller than what we saw in conglomerate or breccia. So on the left here, you can even see that it's a coarser grain material. So it's going to be in the sand size of the sediment size chart, which is 0 0.0625 millimeters up to 2 millimeters in diameter. This one, however, is so tiny you would need a microscope and even then, you can hardly differentiate out the different class because it's less than 0 0.002 millimeters in diameter. So which rock would that be on the sediment clastic chart that we learned about? Shale would be the right answer. So what do these rocks represent? Man, this one sure looks a lot like shale. Is it? Is it not? Give you a hint, I gave you another one over here next door that's a relative of it. And these have to do with grades of heat and or pressure applied to that rock. In this case, these are foliated metamorphic rocks. This is always going to be a low grade. So this is slate, and this is the one step up in metamorphism where you start seeing a lot of micas and biotites and union chloride. It gives it that metallic sheen, and it has that wavy appearance, which would be violite. These are foliated metamorphic rocks. All right, what do these represent? Give you a clue. The one on the right has a lot of clues in it. So first of all, shells. That means they formed at the surface, so that's going to be a sedimentary rock, more than likely. And since we're talking about stuff that gets made by calcitic material, I think we're talking about limestone here. Both of these are types of limestone. One is chalk and one is coquina, so which one is which? I think you can guess, and if you don't know which one's coquina, I want you to know because this is, and it's such a fabulous piece and sample of that type of limestone. This one has a clue right off the bat. It's those lines and bands in it, so that makes it a special type of metamorphic rock that's always going to be a high-grade metamorphic rock. Nice. It is a friendly, nice rock that is G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, not just an N-I-C-E rock. So nice. My favorite personal metamorphic rock is because it has some really just incredible conditions by which it formed. So you have to imagine this used to be like salt and pepper granite, which was an intrusive igneous rock, but it under probably got buried under a mountain range and got heated and pressurized really severely, like in a high-grade metamorphic conditions, and this is what happened to it. 
Ooh, what are these? Well, hmm. I don't see this, but I do see crystals. Very visible in this one and this one, not so visible in this one. These are all the same rock, by the way. Not the exact same rock, but the same rock name. <laughs> they are a metamorphic rock that are non-foliated and they come from quartz sandstone. So if you need to review what that particular rock Par, uh, parent rock is the quartz sandstone and what it makes I need you to know what that is for testing purposes the point being that this particular metamorphic rock goes from lower to higher grade metamorphism so by the time we come over here it's recrystallized and multiple times which is the higher grade version of it what is this they're in pairs I did this on purpose so we got one of these at the bottom and then we got a lava rock on top and they're black so if you get out that chart for igneous that puts it in the mafic category mafic margaritas so what's the name for the lava rock the aponitic one and what's the name for the phanaritic one you need to know those which is which in their names so the top one's basalt and the bottom one is gabbro Ooh, what's this you're like, well, there might be some of this. There's not. So I'm going to take that one out. It can't be igneous. So this is, I'm going to help you out with this one. It's marble, and it's pure marble. I would mention that in our, our metamorphic lesson. White uh, marble's pure, and the impurities actually add intrinsic value to marble. So don't confuse any streaks you might see in marble that it would be um, some type of banding for nice. It's not... So this was primarily caused by heat. It has a non-foliated texture, but one of the key testing term things here, it'd be that it has a parent rock of limestone or dolostone all the time, always. And it can come in in any grade of metamorphism. Non-foliated rocks, just as I showed you a few slides back, that was quartzite, by the way they can come in all different levels of grade of metamorphism. Unlike slate and gneiss who have very specific places that they form in grades of metamorphism. You should recognize this one. This one hits the arrowheads, spearheads, points, if, especially if you're an archaeology buff and you like to collect these things legally, I hope. And anyhow, when you look at this, you can see the limestone at the top here this is a chert, okay? So I need you to ask yourself, what kind of sedimentary rock would that be? Would it be clastic slash detrital, or would it be chemical slash biochemical? And the big hint is the limestone part. This is replacing the limestone. It's reprecipitating. So it is definitely a chemical sedimentary rock. So as we looked at all those rocks, I need to remind the obvious here that magmatism started the rock cycle. And it's going to continue to fuel the rock cycle until the interior of the Earth can no longer produce that heat from the radioactive decay in the core of, thing, of elements like uranium. So most rocks will end up being subducted or buried. I always want to make sure we're clear that not every rock is going to get subducted. It may just get buried under tens and thousands of feet of sediments and be metamorphosed. And then it gets deep enough that it becomes molten uh, rock again, which puts it back into the igneous category. Because remember, the rock cycle always started with magma. So looking at that rock cycle again, please remember that it is not just one way. In other words, the rock cycle can go in any direction once we started it with magma, and rocks can be an igneous rock once, turn into an igneous rock again a second time, maybe the next time it weathers into a sedimentary rock, and then the next time it gets melted in a magma chamber back to an igneous rock, and the next time it gets metamorphosed. And it's going to keep making its cycles, and remember that mineral called zircons? They can help us figure out what has happened to rocks. So that is an important indicator mineral of geologic past. I am now going to give you a very special nature moment. And this is one of my favorite places in Glacier National Park where you have a cascading set of waterfalls. It's right near 
a famous landmark called the Weeping Wall. And as you watch this, I want you just to see the serenity of it. And you've had a lot of information that you've been learning in this class, and it's time just to sit back for a minute, whew, absorb the beauty of sedimentary rocks in that area, glaciation, and enjoy nature for what it has to offer. I'm excited to share with you Section 10 over the fossil record. Please join me back then. Until I see you next time, geology rocks. Bye.